Professor Jonathan Kay is Professor of Medicine and Population and Quantitative Health Science and holds the Timothy and Elian Peterson Chair in Rheumatology at the University of Massachusetts Medical School in Worcester, where he directs clinic research in the Division of Rheumatology. His clinical appointment is a physician at UMass Memorial Medical Center, also in Worcester. He received his medical degree from the University of California School of Medicine in San Francisco, California. He then completed an internship and residency at the hospital of the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia and fellowship in rheumatology and immunology in the Brigman and Women's Hospital and Harvard Medical School in Boston, Massachusetts. Professor Kay is a fellow of the American College of Rheumatology and of the American College of Physicians. In 2018, he received the Distinguished Service Award from the American College of Rheumatology, and he was awarded honorary membership in EULAR. Professor Kay's clinic interest spans the spectrum of rheumatic diseases, with special interest in rheumatoid arthritis, spondylarthropathy, and other form of inflammatory arthritis. He was a member of the group that developed the 2010 ACR EULAR diagnosis and the classification criteria for rheumatoid arthritis. He chaired the rheumatology working group and was a member of the internal medicine and musculoskeletal topic advisory group of the World Health Organization in its revision of the international classification of disease ICD-11. Professor Kay has been a principal investigator on over 60 clinical trials of novel therapies for rheumatoid arthritis, axial spondylarthritis, gout, and osteoarthritis. Over the past decade, he has been involved in the development of biosimilar to treat rheumatic diseases. He lectures internationally and is the author of more than 240 publications and book chapters. Please, Professor Kay, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for that kind introduction. It's a great pleasure to be addressing your group about optimizing cost-effective treatment for rheumatic diseases, the role of biosimilars. I'm going to start by giving a little bit of background about biologics and defining biosimilars and biosimilarity. I'll then talk about biosimilars for inflammatory diseases, variability, drift, and evolution of biopharmaceuticals, demonstration of biosimilarity, switching, the nocebo effect, and then comments about economic aspects, since this is the most important part of biosimilars. The draft American College of Rheumatology 2020 pharmacologic treatment recommendations for rheumatoid arthritis were just presented on November 9th at ACR Convergence 2020 by Leanna Frankel. Uh, the guidelines or recommendations describe an approach of treat to target aiming for low disease activity or remission. For patients who are DMARD naive with moderate to high disease activity, methotrexate is strongly recommended over other conventional disease modifying antirheumatic drugs, biologic agents, or targeted synthetic DMARD monotherapy, and conditionally recommended over leflunamide, conventional synthetic DMARD dual or triple therapy, or the combination of methotrexate and TNF inhibitors. For patients not at target who are on maximally tolerated doses of methotrexate, adding a biologic agent or targeted synthetic DMARD was conditionally recommended over adding hydroxychloroquine and sulfasalazine for triple therapy. And if the patient is at target for at least six months on the combination of methotrexate and a biologic agent or targeted synthetic DMARD, gradual discontinuation of methotrexate was conditionally recommended over discontinuation of the biologic agent or the targeted synthetic DMARD. Thus, patients are going to remain on expensive biologic therapy long-term. For axial spondyl arthritis, the 2019 update of the American College of Rheumatology Spartan uh, Spondylitis Association of America recommendations for treatment of ankylosing spondylitis and non-radiographic axial spondyl arthritis conditionally recommended continuous treatment with non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs over on-demand treatment with NSAIDs and strongly recommended treating adults with active ankylosing spondylitis who are inadequately responsive to NSAIDs with TNF inhibitors over IL-17 inhibition or tofacitinib. 
the 2016 ASAS ULAR management for rec recommendations for axial spondyl arthritis indicated that biologic DMARG should be considered in patients with persistently high disease activity despite conventional treatments. And the current practice is to start with TNF inhibitor therapy. And only if TNF inhibitor therapy failed, switching to another TNF inhibitor or an IL-17 inhibitor should be considered. So again, biologic agents are recommended for treatment of axial spondyl arthritis. There are inequities in access to biologic and synthetic DMARDs in Europe. Uh, this paper by Paulina Putrick, published in Annals of Rheumatic Diseases, shows that the access to these agents is directly proportional to the gross domestic product per capita in these countries, with uh, countries such as Georgia, uh, Albania, and Russia having lower access and countries such as Norway and the Netherlands and the United Kingdom having much more access to these agents. Because of this difficulty in affording biopharmaceuticals, biosimilars have been developed. The regulatory definition of biosimilarity in the United States is that the product is highly similar to the reference product, notwithstanding minor differences in clinically inactive components, and there are no clinically meaningful differences between the biologic product and the reference product in terms of safety, purity, and potency of the product. A biosimilar, uh, in my definition, uh, based on reviewing not only the United States definition, but other countries as well, is a legitimate copy of a biopharmaceutical that no longer is protected by patent, which meets two criteria. First, it has undergone rigorous analytical and clinical assessment in comparison to its reference product, but it also has to have been approved by a regulatory agency in a highly regulated area according to a specific pathway for biosimilar evaluation. There are a number of biosimilars that have been approved for treatment of inflammatory diseases. As of today in the European Union, there are 21 approved, four infliximabs, three etanercepts, eight adalimumabs, and six rituximabs. In the United States, there are 14 approved, but only five of these are on the market uh, because of the inavailability of etanercept and adalimumab biosimilars in the United States. Uh, Canada, Australia each have 10 approved biosimilars to treat inflammatory diseases, and Japan and South Korea have seven and eight respectively. All biologic agents are subject to normal batch to batch variability. The variability is defined as falling within proven acceptable ranges of variation, which are established during the development of the biopharmaceutical in collaboration between the regulators and the manufacturer. And these fall into various categories, such as higher order structure, impurities, function, primary structure, product related substances, such as glycation, particulates and aggregates and stability. And the product is monitored over time to assure that variation in quality attributes falls within these proven acceptable ranges of variation. As long as they fall within these ranges, the product is felt to not pose a safety or efficacy risk to patients. There's also drift that occurs during manufacture, which is due to unintended alterations in manufacturing, which result in deviation of the product attributes over time. In the top graph, you see a gradual increase in this uh, attribute uh, falling within the proven acceptable range of variation. This is a trend. And on the bottom graph, you see a sudden shift, uh, which is also within the proven acceptable range of variation delineated by the horizontal lines above and below the graph. Now, in addition to normal batch to batch variability and drift, there is evolution, which is due to deliberate process changes made by the manufacturer, such as implementation of state of the art technology or scaling up production to increase uh, the availability of the medication. These changes are known to both manufacturer and regulators. And by 2013, uh, according to an editorial published in Annals of Rheumatic Diseases by Christian Schneider of the EMA, there had been 37 such manufacturing process changes after approval for Remicade, 21 for Embrel, and 18 for Humira. Now, commercial lots of bioriginators are not identical to one another. Small modifications in the manufacturing processes may result in gradual changes. A very important paper published by Martin Schiestel, the chief scientific officer of Sandoz in Nature Biotechnology in 2011, uh, his group characterized 
different commercially available lots of atanercept, rituximab, and darbapoetin that had been produced between 2007 and 2011 and found variations in both C-terminal lysine content and glycosylation. Shown here for atanercept, after a product uh, manufacturer change, uh, there were more basic variants of atanercept and there were more uh, G0 fucose and less G2 fucosylation on the glycan mapping chromatogram. Despite these differences, however, when the product is within the pre-specified proven acceptable ranges of variation, it is marketed with no change in label and neither patients nor providers are informed of these variations. Changes in bioriginator manufacturing processes may result in differences compared to the initially approved product. Comparing pre and post change batches of rituximab, here uh, the pre-change product, the uh, G0 glycan content, and a threefold increase after the change in manufacture. And then a functional change where there was an increase in antibody dependent cell mediated cytotoxicity potency of the product, of the reference product rituximab after this change in variation. But again, since these ranges fell within the proven acceptable range of variation, these products were released for commercial availability. Now to develop a biosimilar, the biosimilar manufacturer purchases commercially available lots of the reference product, the bioriginator, and subjects them to many different analytic assays, both chemical functional uh, assays, as well as some animal assessment of toxicity. And they here you see the pre-change initial quality reference product range for the reference product. And after a change in manufacture, the current reference product quality range of the commercially available batches. So the range for control of the biosimilar is based on the current reference product quality range and is narrower than the reference product quality range over time. So the biosimilar has tighter proven acceptable ranges of variation, at least as uh, at least the same or narrower than the reference product. To demonstrate biosimilarity, the biosimilar has been shown to be highly similar to the reference product in extensive comparative analytical studies. Uh, and it must demonstrate similar efficacy and safety compared to the reference product in pharmacokinetic or pharmacodynamic studies and immunogenicity studies, and in a smaller double-blind parallel group active comparator clinical trial or trials, it must demonstrate equivalent efficacy to the reference product. No differences are expected in safety or efficacy between an approved biosimilar and its reference product, and hence the indications can be extrapolated based upon a clinical trial in one indication to other indications for which the reference product has already been approved by regulators. So there's no need to demonstrate efficacy of biosimilars in all indications. This is an example of a biosimilar clinical trial. This is a phase three double-blind randomized controlled trial of adalimumab ADAZ, as it's called in the United States, or GP2017, uh, compared to bioriginator adalimumab in rheumatoid arthritis. In the first study period, 176, 177 patients were randomized to receive either the reference adalimumab or the biosimilar candidate. And the primary endpoint was changed from baseline DAS28 CRP uh, with a, an equivalence uh, margin of plus or minus 0.6. Uh, at week 24, all those subjects who were originally on reference adalimumab were switched to the biosimilar for another 24 weeks uh, and additional safety and efficacy data were collected with this switch, the single switch from the reference product to the biosimilar. The primary endpoint is shown on the left at week 12, the change, the mean change from baseline in DAS28 CRP. And the difference was only 0.2 with 95% confidence intervals of minus 0.24 to 0.27, which falls within the range of minus 0.6 to 0.6. So this uh, primary endpoint met the criterion of equivalence. And you can see as a secondary endpoint, the absolute change in the DAS28 CRP over 48 weeks and the two curves are virtually superimposable. So not only was there essentially no difference in the mean change from baseline in DAS28 CRP at 12 weeks, but at each of the earlier time points and later time point, the two molecules behaved virtually identically. 
This is an interesting biosimilar comparative trial. This is of trastuzumab, a uh, uh, drug that's used to treat HER2 positive early breast cancer. Herceptin is the brand name of the reference product. And this biosimilar study was interesting in that it showed that the reference product actually drifted over time and became less effective than it was originally, something that can only be shown by comparing it to its biosimilar candidate. During the neoadjuvant treatment period, uh, subjects were randomized to receive eight cycles of either trastuzumab or the biosimilar candidate with four cycles of doxataxel and four cycles of fluorouracil, epirubicin, and cyclophosphamide. They then underwent surgery to remove the breast tumor and they looked for a pathologic complete remission, which was the primary endpoint. And then subjects underwent 10 cycles of adjuvant treatment with either reference or biosimilar trastuzumab. Uh, there was a long-term extension study for an additional 60 months, uh, continuing on the same medications. And the primary endpoint, which was the proportion of subjects achieving a pathologic complete remission in the breast, 51.7% of those treated with the biosimilar and 42% of those treated with the bio-originator with an adjusted ratio of 1.259, which fell within the predefined equivalence margin, 95% confidence intervals fell within the predefined equivalence margin of 0.785 to 1.546. So this met the criterion for biosimilarity. However, a secondary endpoint looked at the adjusted difference, which was 10.70, which fell uh, outside uh, the 95% confidence interval, the upper bound of 17.26 fell outside of the predefined equivalence margin of plus or minus 13%. Although this was not the primary endpoint and equivalence had already been demonstrated, this raised questions as to whether this might be a bio better, which would not be a biosimilar. So the manufacturer performed analytic studies looking at the reference product, and they looked at the comparators, both European Union sourced Herceptin and United States sourced Herceptin, and they found that lots that were purchased in 2019 had a lower content of a fucose and high mannose, and then that drifted back upwards in lots between 2019 and 2020. This change was associated with a relative decrease in FC gamma R3A binding and antibody dependent cell mediated cytotoxicity. So there was a functional correlate of this change in glycosylation. And when they looked at event free survival by antibody dependent cell mediated cytotoxicity, they looked at the biosimilar SB3 in blue, non drifted trastuzumab reference product in red, and in orange, drifted trastuzumab in a dotted line. And what you can see here is that there was lower event-free survival with the reference product that had drifted. So the product that was manufactured between 2019 and 2020 compared to earlier lots and the biosimilar had been created in comparison to those earlier lots. So this study is very notable in that it demonstrated that this drift in the attributes of the reference product resulted in a lower event-free survival. So the biosimilar itself was comparable to the earlier lots, which were very effective, but the more recent trastuzumab reference product was less effective. Now I'll turn over to the topic of switching. Uh, there was a randomized uh, double-blind non-inferiority phase four trial conducted in Norway, the NORSWITCH trial funded by the Norwegian government that compared continuing infliximab bio-originator uh, to switching to Celtrion's infliximab DYYB in patients with stable disease for at least six months with each of the indications for which infliximab is indicated. Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, axial spinal arthritis, rheumatoid arthritis, psoriatic arthritis, or psoriasis. Subjects were randomized one-to-one -to, -one to either continue the bio-originator or to switch to the biosimilar for a year and the primary endpoint was disease worsening during 52 weeks of follow-up, defined either by worsening according to disease-specific composite measures, individualized for the different diseases, or a consensus between the investigator and the patient that resulted in a major change in treatment. At week 52, subjects who were on the reference product were switched to the biosimilar and followed up for an additional 26 weeks. The non-inferiority margin was established as plus or minus 
and exploratory subgroup analyses looked at disease worsening within each of the six diagnoses. So this study was a positive study in that the non-inferiority margin is the dotted line uh, minus 15%, and the left-hand portion of the 95% confidence intervals for the overall group did not reach that minus 15%. So the uh, overall uh, group comparing uh, switching to the biosimilar to continuation on the bioriginator was not inferior. Uh, however, except for spinal arthritis, none of the individual diseases uh, proved to be non-inferior, but this study was not powered to look at individual diseases. Hence, uh, this study was a positive study demonstrating that switching to the biosimilar infliximab was non-inferior to continuing treatment with reference product. I'd like to turn now to the nocebo effect. Uh, we've all heard of the placebo effect, which means in Latin, I will please. Nocebo in Latin means I will harm, and it refers to symptoms and or physiologic changes that follow the administration of an inert chemically inactive substance, which a patient believes to be an active drug. It refers to distressing symptoms that accompany administration of an inert substance in about 25% of individuals, and may also account for side effects experienced by patients taking an active drug. Misattribution of bodily symptoms to a drug is more likely to occur in patients who expect to experience these distressing side effects, those who have experienced side effects to other drugs in the past, patients who are anxious, depressed, or who tend to somaticize, and patients with erroneous information and misunderstandings about the drug. It can be addressed by education, avoidance of imparting negative expectations about a drug, open collaborative discussion, reassurance, and encouragement of a patient. An important study was conducted in Nijmegen in the Netherlands by Lika Twihosen and colleagues, and they looked at persistence uh, of treatment uh, in patients who were switched from reference etanercept to etanercept biosimilar with a structured communication strategy. All patients were informed that lower costs and fewer injection site reactions with the biosimilar were the reason for transitioning and rheumatology nurses and pharmacy staff were trained in how to counsel patients about biosimilars and how to discuss the possible nocebo response. These 625 patients with rheumatoid arthritis, psoriatic arthritis, or axial spinal arthritis were compared to a historical cohort of 600 patients treated with reference or bioriginator tanercept, two thirds of whom were in both cohorts. The primary outcome was the adjusted hazard ratio between discontinuation of the biosimilar in the transition cohort and discontinuation of the reference product in the historical cohort. And this hazard ratio was 1.57 with 95% confidence intervals that did not cross unity. So this was a significant difference, but in terms of clinically, uh, the crude six month etanercept bioriginator retention rate in the historical cohort was 92% and the biosimilar retention rate in the transition cohort was 90%. So when you look at the Kaplan-Meier plot of the crude retention rates, uh, the two curves are virtually superimposable. Now, the main reason for discontinuation of the reference product in the historical cohort was lack of effect, but the major reason for discontinuation of the biosimilar in the transition cohort was adverse events, which suggests that patients were more sensitive to thinking that they were experiencing an adverse event uh, when they were on a biosimilar uh, because perhaps of the nocebo effect. So education can decrease the nocebo effect, uh, but not necessarily absolutely eliminate it. So the justification for biosimilars is one of the social contract of the Enlightenment, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, who uh, and the potential risk to the individual of switching to a lower cost biosimilar should be outweighed by the potential benefit to society of expanding access to care for all. Potential benefits of biosimilars are that the availability of biosimilars should decrease the cost of treating patients. Lower priced biosimilars introduce market competition, provoking discounts and rebates for the reference products, and multiple biosimilars of the same reference product drive the price down. Biosimilars should be more readily available to patients for whom the bioriginator had been inaccessible. Uh, in the United States, we have formularies, uh, insurance formularies, and preferred formulary status could lessen the burden of obtaining 
uh, authorization, which is required before we can prescribe a biopharmaceutical and might allow earlier access to effective treatment with biopharmaceuticals. Greater global access to effective biopharmaceuticals with lower cost should reduce the disability, morbidity, and mortality associated with inflammatory diseases. So advantages of lower cost biosimilars to the payer, greater competition in the market should result in price reductions and direct savings. And this spending could be redirected toward expanded patient access, either with the same molecule or other medicines, innovative treatments. For providers, it facilitates the choice of the most appropriate treatment for the patient and has the potential to improve treatment outcomes. And for patients, medications for optimal treatment should be more accessible, but most importantly, the patient should share in the financial savings. The savings should not just be given to the payer uh, or to the provider. Some examples of budget savings, uh, in Norway, there's a tender process where every year uh, hospital administered medications are put up for bid and the medication with the lowest bid that's acceptable to the government and providers wins and becomes the sole agent for that compound that is available in Norway for the year. Uh, the tender for biologics in Norway yielded price reductions for Remsema, biosimilar infliximab compared to the reference product of 39% in 2014 and 69% in 2015. Subsequently, the numbers have not been public, but beginning in 2014, Norwegian patients initiating treatment with infliximab were started on less expensive biosimilar. And you can see here that the total expenditure, which is the uh, black line in this graph, decreased despite more patients uh, being treated uh, with infliximab in 2016. And the total expenditure uh, for infliximab was reduced by 2016. In the United Kingdom, here we see uh, Paul Emery receiving his Order of the British Empire from Queen Elizabeth. And he said uh, in 2019 that the cost of biosimilar adalimumab in the coming year will be less than 3,000 US dollars annually in the United Kingdom healthcare system. Uh, in the United States, the price of Humira had risen from about $19,000 a year in 2012 to more than $38,000 in 2018 per patient after rebates. And in 2016, Humira could cost consumers, insurance, employers, or taxpayers $50,000 or more a year per patient. So with the cost of $3,000 per year in the UK uh, and in the United States, $38,000, you could treat six to eight patients with Humira in the United States for the same amount of money that you could treat 100 patients with biosimilar adalimumab in the United Kingdom. Quite a striking contrast. Competition from biosimilars has also driven down the price of the bio-originator, the reference product. Here is a product forecast for Amgevita, Amgen's adalimumab biosimilar in Europe. And the expectation was that sales of Amgevita uh, in terms of millions of euros in 2022 would be nearly 140 million euros. So faced with this competition in late October, 2018, AbbVie won the Swedish national tender for adalimumab by dropping its price by 80%. Uh, adalimumab biosimilars were available in Nordic countries at 10 to 80% discounts, but this 80% reduction in price for Humira made Humira the sole uh, adalimumab available in Sweden in 2019. However, AbbVie could afford to do this because Nordic markets constitute only four to five percent of their international business. In the United States, the average sales price reflects the uh, wholesale price of a drug with discounts and rebates. And in this graph, you can see over time between the first quarter of 2017 on the left and the fourth quarter of 2020 that the price of Remicade and the two available infliximab biosimilars have all decreased infliximab biosimilar uh, Celtrion's product in 2017 uh, cost $1,003 uh, for a 100 milligram vial compared to $822 for Remicade. But by 2020, the difference in price is only about uh, $40 uh, in terms of the average sales price between the reference product and the least expensive biosimilar. So what do I tell my patients? I tell my patients that biosimilars approved in the United States by the Food and Drug Administration have been compared extensively to their reference products in many ways and have been shown to have equivalent efficacy and comparable safety. 
An FDA approved biosimilar is like another batch of its reference product and use of a lower cost biosimilar benefits others with your condition by allowing more people to be treated with an effective medication. Savings realized by using biosimilars may be redirected to pay for new treatments that address unmet needs. So in summary, all biologics are subject to variability with drift and evolution occurring over time. Changing from bioriginators to their biosimilars in clinical trials does not result in significant loss of efficacy or increased occurrence of adverse events or immunogenicity. Availability of biosimilars introduces market competition that should drive down the cost of biopharmaceuticals. And if the actual cost of a biosimilar is not lower than that of its reference product after discounts and rebates, availability of the biosimilar introduces market competition that results in effective treatment for patients with the reference product at a lower cost. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Professor Kay, for this uh, update on biosimilar and the impact of the cost of treatment on a society. Uh, I think we have a few of questions, but we have time for one or two questions only. Uh, I have a question here. What is your experience with multiple switching between several biosimilars? So we have two uh, biosimilar infliximabs available in the United States, and uh, switching between them really makes no difference. Uh, there have been studies that have looked at, in France and other countries uh, at that experience and have shown no increase in immunogenicity or loss of efficacy. Uh, thank you. Uh, I think we can have the last question. What is the percentage of patients in your state taking biosimilars as compared to originator? Where the biosimilar when prescribed the by the physicians themselves or enforced by his medical authorities? So that's an excellent question. Uh, the number is not well known. Uh, it's probably about 4%. Unfortunately, there's been a very low uptake of biosimilars in the United States. Uh, but that has largely been due to uh, restrictions placed on the availability of biosimilars by the manufacturers of the reference product, uh, delayed access, uh, and big discounts and rebates that are given to the pharmacy benefit management companies to incentivize them to put the reference product on their formulary and not allow us to use the biosimilar. But in large healthcare systems, uh, biosimilars have been uh, embraced readily, uh, and I anticipate that over the next several years, we'll see a marked increase uh, in the use of infliximab and rituximab biosimilars. And in 2023, when we have adalimumab biosimilars available, I look forward to their use as well. Okay, thank you, Professor Kay. And now we can move for the, our other uh, topic uh, for today. Thank you, Professor. Thank you.